welcome to the show. This is episode number 94 of Pop Culturally Deprived, and today we're going to be talking about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves on your Someone Stole Our Dishes podcast. I'm Mandy Kay. And I'm Matthew Vose. Before we get started, we just wanted to remind everyone that there are only a couple of weeks left to get your audio into us if you want to participate in our 100th episode celebration. The deadline to record something, get it to us, is November the 28th. And this week we are joined by my friend Nichelle Osaurus, who is the biggest Disney fan I know. So I knew that we had to have her on when we decided to make November Disney Month. So welcome to the show, Nichelle. Hi, um, I'm also the biggest Disney fan that I know, and I'm super excited <laughs> to talk to you guys about Disney. Yay, I'm so, so glad. So there's no imposter syndrome here, like, no. I am the person to come and talk to you. No, I'm definitely <laughs> the right one, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so we are kicking off with the the first uh, cinematic Disney, the first full, full-length feature uh, animation that they did, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Mandy, how come you've never seen... Pretty much the oldest long full length cartoon. Oh, no judgment, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it is really kind of shameful, isn't it? Um, so growing up, I was much more of a book person than a movie person. And we all already know, I mean, I have a podcast about never having watched things. So we just didn't really watch a lot of things when I was a kid. Um, so I had the full set of Disney storybooks, not the movies. And that's why I'm really, really familiar with all of the characters and the stories. And I'm so familiar with them that I didn't actually realize I hadn't seen these until we started talking about Disney movies for the show. Okay. That's fair. N- Nichelle, did you see this? Have you seen this at the cinema? Did you see it as a kid? Is this a one you well, came I'm to late? Well, I'm not that old. It came out in 1937. <laughs> I didn't see it in the cinema. <laughs> Okay, um, okay. It has been re-released. <laughs> uh, no, I've seen this movie like hundreds of times. Um, I I actually also had the storybooks growing up, um, nice. but I also had all of the Disney movies. And um, like my grandma had every VHS from Disney ever. And so anytime any of the grandkids came over, we got to watch Disney movies there. Um, cool. And then in college, uh, I, I actually watched this movie to fall asleep every night because I wasn't super good at living in dorms that were really loud. Um, and so Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was my like backdrop to sleep. So I've seen the first 20 minutes like hundreds of times. <laughs> yeah. So you could say it was Snow White noise. <laughs> you could say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Matthew. <laughs> we're on form today. Um, for anyone who doesn't know about this, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is a 1937 animated film produced by Walt Disney. Mm. It is the first full-length animated feature that was produced by the Disney company and the first full-length cell animated film at all. The story is based on the Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Snow White was a huge success for Disney. It became the highest grossing sound film on its initial release, and it has been re-released theatrically on a number of occasions, which allows it to be the 10th highest grossing film ever. It is just after The Exorcist and just ahead of Star Wars The Force Awakens. Wow. Snow White was nominated for the Best Score Oscar at the 10th Academy Awards, which was won by 100 Men and a Girl. And Walt Disney was then given an honorary award at the 11th Academy Awards to recognise the achievement of creating this film. The actual award that he was given is one full-size Oscar statue and seven miniature statuettes on a stepped base. Um, I am definitely putting a picture of that in the show notes because it is adorable. And it has Shirley Temple in the picture, which just doubles the adorableness. Yeah, she presented it to him. I'm assuming okay. it was just on a thing. I can't imagine her walking out with it. <laughs> it's massive statue. It's as big as she is. It really is. <laughs> Snow White was inducted into the National Film Registry as part of the first round of films in 1989 for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. It has remained a major part of the Disney canon, features in theme parks, video games, and forms the basis for ABC's series Once Upon a Time. And I think... Just about everybody in the world probably knows what Snow White is about, even if you haven't seen it, because I don't think anybody's quite that pop culturally deprived. (laughs) But IMDb says, Exiled into the dangerous forest by her wicked stepmother, a princess is rescued by seven dwarf miners who make her part of their household. Which I always think is kind of strange. It is a little bit of a weird, like series of relationships that happen in this film isn't it it really is 
and her to- total assumption they're children. Oh, there must be lovely small children living here on their own. <laughs> That's normal and fine. Yeah. Well, act- you know, she was a child herself, so. True. Yeah. So we kind of already answered this a little bit, but how did you watch this one? You obviously own this being the biggest Disney fan in the world. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I have all of the Disney animated features on DVD um, and I have digital copies of them on my computer. So I, I owned this one. Awesome. Matthew, where were you able to watch it? Uh, it's on Sky Cinema at the moment. They have a, a massive catalog of Disney features right now, oh, which nice. is awesome timing, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and I was absolutely shocked to discover that this movie is available to rent on Amazon. I honestly yes. thought I wasn't going to be able to find it anywhere. I was glad I did. Okay, so November is Disney month. We are going to be covering a number of Disney films almost through the ages. Um, we don't quite spread out exactly, but they're pretty good. Um, Mandy, what's your experience of Disney films in general? I've seen most of the Disney mm-hmm. Renaissance films, but that's really kind of about all um i started watching again when disney acquired pixar but there are still so so many that i haven't seen okay any any favorites you could pick up from them the little mermaid okay and tangled solid choices yeah (laughs) tangled is amazing yeah tangled is amazing snow white and the seven dwarfs uh, like we say, it's based on an, uh, a fairly old fairy tale as well and has been part of Disney's canon, has been featured in other things. So what's your experience of this story and this telling? Uh, well, like you mentioned in the history section, uh, most recently, the television show Once Upon a Time. Um, God, I probably stopped watching that after like season five, but I watched it pretty fanatically for a while. Yeah, um, same. I yeah, loved it. I and then it's it really good four, until it wasn't. Mm. Yeah. Um, I also did watch the weird Snow White and the Huntsman movie from a couple mm-hmm. years back that had inexplicably Bella and Thor in it. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I have a vague memory that there was a horror adaptation that had Sigourney Weaver in it at one point. Maybe? I don't remember that. Yeah, I think it's... Oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like Snow White, a tale of terror snow white a tale of terror okay well yeah. it's uh it's right around halloween time and i'm gonna look that up <laughs> um i think i like i feel like there have to be more but the internet was not very helpful in showing me things that are adaptations of snow white that don't have snow white in the title so i was struggling to figure out what else i've probably seen that that's an adaptation You've probably not seen this because I I come into this with the assumption that you haven't seen things, man. But, <laughs> yes, that is a good, a good idea. <laughs> yeah, but there's a a mini series that was called The Tenth Kingdom. Have you nope. ever heard of it? No. Okay. No. It's a really cool retelling of like a lot of different fairy tales, but Snow White is sort of a central character in that uh, mini series okay. too. Mm. Cool. I mean, just the word kingdom. It like it. Yeah, right up our street. High fantasy, yeah. awesome. Let's bring it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mandy, did you enjoy Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? It turns out I enjoy the idea of it more than the actual thing. Uh, okay. What What was the idea of it before you saw it? Well, Snow White is just so iconic and so ingrained in our culture as being just the best and one of one of the most amazing Disney princesses and it's this wonderful story and if you don't like it there's something wrong with you kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> but watching the actual movie like the 90 minute movie God, there's so much filler in the story like <laughs> it's not just the story it's okay let's have five minutes of birds singing just because we need to make this a full-length movie mm-hmm. um, and, and so I wasn't super into the movie as a movie like if they had left out all of that filler stuff and just done actually the snow white story i probably would have enjoyed it a little bit more but if they left out all the filler there wouldn't be any adorable woodland creatures and there wouldn't be dopey dancing (laughs) okay that's Mm. a fair point (laughs) yeah you mean you don't want five minutes of dwarves washing their faces and hands (laughs) Which no. seems to be half the film at one stage. <laughs> like, how is this song still going on? Yeah, and it's quite a fun song. Like, it, like I could find a place for it if it wasn't like you say for all the rest of the filler. 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think I think there was just too much filler. Um, and there were I was surprised at how many songs I actually had never heard that were in this one. Okay. Usually if there's a song in a Disney movie, I've at least heard it. Well, at least if it's a classic Disney movie. Mm. Um but I only knew like the three main ones in this one and the other ones. Like the first song Snow White sang, no idea. I'd never heard it in my life. Okay. Um <laughs> so it was just I don't know, it it wasn't the same experience that I usually have when I sit down and watch a Disney movie. I wasn't just completely engaged and enthralled by it. I kind of wonder if that's like an effect of the time that this movie was made, right? Like, you know, we there's a thing where people have changing attention spans and changing expectations mm. for the amount of action in a film. And back in the 30s, attention spans were like people were like, wow, this is 90 minutes of cartoon. This is incredible. And it didn't yeah. so much matter if it was enthralling the whole way through right yeah maybe i think probably had i watched it as a child i probably would have absolutely loved it not that i was a child in the 30s or anything but (laughs) you know what i mean (laughs) you were 50 by that point um (laughs) nichelle can i ask where where does this rank for you did you get love it at one stage and get a bit over it watching it so much at college um i didn't really get over it <laughs> um so i still really love <laughs> this disney. movie yeah because it's disney there's not really any disney movies that i am over um okay. but uh it's not my favorite disney movie um mm. but it's it's up there in the rankings so my uh my husband and i actually watched all of the Disney animated features in chronological order and then ranked them okay. um, cuz we're crazy people um, well cuz i'm a crazy person it was that <laughs> that project was not his choice <laughs> um, but we did, he did it with me and that was great and so Good on him. i i found out that snow white ranked 22 for me oh. um, on the list so out of 73 at the time this was in 2015 um so there's a few new movies now that aren't on the list um, but that's still pretty high. Um, it's definitely like a solid classic Disney movie that I will watch again and again. Where did Brian rank it? <laughs> um, yeah, so Brian ranked it number 53. Um, Ooh, but gosh. I generally say that his rankings are garbage anyway, because uh, <laughs> he did not have The Lion King or Toy Story in his top 10, which is nonsense. So I think ah. that his rankings are like worthless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We shall reject his opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you can you can invite him to defend his position if you want, but <laughs> and, um, and we you may well have, have to. Clearly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you guys did do this online, so we will put a link to yeah. that ranking in our show notes, so everybody else can see um, whether or not they agree. If if you and Brian have have ranked these appropriately, yeah, great. Awesome. <laughs> I I think. You're exactly right. That the the point about you know we expect more from a film now. There is a lot in here that uh, it, it clearly feels like a debut feature. The same thing of when someone comes out with a great first album or the great first book. There is so much attention. They were clearly working on this for such a long time that they've put effort into absolutely everything that goes on here, and, and it almost stands out because we've been watching some other Disney movies like Snow White dancing has feet under her skirt she pulls up her skirt so you can see her feet moving i think any other disney film they'd be like no no no. skirt is floor length you can't see her feet let's cut down on the amount we have to animate Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. they're kind of like oh let's show off a bit let's do something they've gone that extra step there um and there's times where they do things with some of the camera angles that you wouldn't normally do or no that at the time you wouldn't do in a live action film so when she's at the wishing well there was a shot up at her from underneath the water in the wishing well Mm-hmm. You could do that now, and probably in the last 20, 30 years, that would be an okay shot to do. But the fact they were doing this sort of shot in a cartoon, they were, like, they were showing off, hey, this is animation, we can do stuff you can't see in live action. Um, and it has taken a very long time to catch up with. So I think it really does show they spent a lot of money, a lot of effort doing impressive things on screen that are just kind of everyday to us now in some ways. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I can see watching it, even though my end, my like my final reaction was just kind of a meh. I could see the <laughs> okay. the artistry and the uh, the talent that went into making this. You know, I could see these are groundbreaking technologies that they're using to do this movie in 1937, and I can absolutely appreciate that. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit on the the plot. I think. 
because if we're saying there's a lot of filler and actually there's probably only 30 to 60 minutes of actual stuff in here mm-hmm. it, what in the plot did you enjoy that you're like okay that was good i'd want more of that and what would you then put in to make this full length again is there are there changes you could make to it i think the first change that i would make would be to have the huntsman actually explain to snow what's happening okay yeah i mean the way that scene went down would have been so confusing to a real person (laughs) just like i'm about to kill you oh wait no i can't do it run away snow run away that's it like and she didn't just explain it too right she was like she okay did. i'm gonna run away that's it i live in the forest now right um you know it, it would have been helpful to say the queen wants to kill you because she's jealous of you and so if you would like to live and not die you need to hide from the queen and you know let me help you do that <laughs> that's what i would have wanted i think from from that that scene um that was the first thing that that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit I um I appreciate that like later adaptations of this film have really explored the huntsman as a character. Mm-hmm. Um and I I think you know he's only in that one scene really and and we don't even get to see him go back to the queen but he obviously goes back to the queen even though she gave him this order that he couldn't fill. Um and I think he's a super interesting character and I have a ton of questions about like why is he loyal to the queen? Why didn't he fill this order? So I appreciate that that's something that has been explored in later adaptations of the story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I do like the twist they put on it in uh, Once Upon a Time, that the heart is actually a sort of magical artifact, effectively. And that's why she wants it. It's not just some kind of weird gore fetish. Because um, <laughs> that is slightly strange. Like, Bring Me Her Heart is really quite dark for a children's film. The Queen is pretty dark for a children's film in general. Mm. I think there's like a lot in this film that is actually pretty scary for a kid. I definitely agree. I was surprised. The opening of this by starting with the Queen was kind of scary. The whole scene of her transforming into the hag was terrifying. I It made me wonder, did they... It, was the core audience for this children in 1937 or was it just anybody who's going to watch a movie i don't know yeah in that historical context i don't know because it was really dark mm. we, was. we we touched a bit on this with spirited away the understanding that actually you can have some scary elements in a ch- children's film because it is an important lesson for them to learn mm-hmm. so maybe they had that philosophy in there as well maybe maybe or maybe kids were just tougher in the 30s also a possibility yeah they come in from playing with their hoop and stick and you know (laughs) i don't know what kids did in old days (laughs) yeah so at the point the huntsman lets her go she doesn't know the queen is kind of after her or evil so she just goes off and now starts this new life with some dwarfs um we have a lot of time with the dwarfs and again there's some interesting backstory you could pull on there about their mining operation and how they sell the gems and what they do with them Oh, yeah, that was one of my questions, because that's never... I never even really knew what they mined. I just knew they were dwarves with pickaxes. And so watching this movie, and you see all of the sparkly gems, and they have a vault that they lock, even though they hang the key right next to the door. Like, <laughs> yeah. what do they do with these gems? Do they sell them to the queen? They, do they... they don't know. They In their song about mining, they say something like, we mine the whole day through and like we pick up all these gems but we don't know why we're doing it like <laughs> wow, okay it's, not, it's just like a pastime i think like they're not <laughs> it's not their livelihood it's just sort of like what they do for fun during the day <laughs> that's the vibe okay. i get from that song i'm gonna have to go back and look at the yeah. lyrics of that song yeah <laughs> because yeah they are basically pre-cut gems of all different sorts <laughs> that's right it's like at some point there was a jewelry store there. It decayed into the ground and they're now digging it back up. Are they actually like archaeologists? Well, no, because that's bones, not gems. Okay. But- <laughs> oh, yeah, and they were they were sorting the gems by size. They had like things that said like 20 carats and, and 22 carats and things like that. So, and mm. it was, I think it was Doc who had the, the jeweler's glass where that's he was right. looking at the quality uh-huh. of the gem. It's really bizarre. But, like, yeah, they've got this whole vault of gems, and then they live in this mm. tiny little house, but they all share a room. So they're clearly not, you know, making the most of their um, assets. Right. Mm. So if 
if Snow White had been the queen basically didn't let her be a princess. The queen made her live as a scullery maid, which is mm. what the introduction the introductory card told us. So if that's true, how did everybody know that she was the princess? Cuz the queen's super scary, but they all know anyway. Yeah, everybody knew that the queen was like an evil witch too and they were just like, well, that's the way the world is. There's a princess and then there's an evil queen and everybody knows about it and there's really nothing we can do to change that. Okay. That's really depressing. Hmm. I think in the original story, like, this is another thing that's not really explained here, but the queen is her stepmother, and never in this movie do we talk about her dad or her Mm. real mother. Um, But, like, in the original story, her real mother died in childbirth, and then her father remarried the queen, and so her father was the king. And so everybody knew that the king had a child, because he had a child before the queen was in the picture. So I think everybody would still know that there was a princess, right? Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I, I have questions about the magic mirror as well. Because that's the, the one of the big magic things that she uses. Is that a, an actual magic mirror? Is that a dude stuck in the mirror? How do we think the, the magic mirror came into being? I don't know how it came into being, but I was paying extra attention this time as I watched the movie. And it mm. occurred to me that the queen called the magic mirror man a slave from space. He's a space slave. That sounds okay. awesome. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Her, like, incantation to get the magic mirror to turn on was, like, slave in the mirror, come from space to tell me the answers to my questions. She called a slave from space. Okay, I was so you've got aliens that. and Snow White. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's really sounding like a DC film. It's getting so dark. <laughs> it's just... It's got a whole Green Lantern portal thing going on. I like it. (laughs) Speaking of the mirror, are you guys subject to the Mandela effect the way that I am on this one? Because I swear it's always been mirror, mirror on the wall and it is not. Yeah. Yeah, completely. It's so strange to hear it properly, isn't it? Yes. (laughs) Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Oh, I'm fairly sure you're not going to be able to answer this. What did it say in your storybooks? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, my gosh. Mm. I don't remember, but my storybook is in the next room over, so I will go check after we record, and I'll Mm. let you know. Okay. Yeah. Because you assume it's Magic Mirror, but... I would think so. (laughs) In my head, But why do we remember it wrong? Yeah. 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 Everybody remembers it wrong. Yeah. It's, It's so, so bizarre. Even to the extent that there is an adaptation called mirror mirror that's right i haven't seen i think that's the one that has julia roberts, julia roberts yeah. In it. yeah which came out at the same time as the huntsman snow white and the huntsman there were like two snow white films that same year yeah i've only seen the huntsman as well and bits of the sequel which looked worse <laughs> um okay can we talk snow white herself because she's she absolutely is a princess, but like you say, she's very, very young. I feel like in the kind of oh, 15 or however many princesses we're up to now, she's still canonically the youngest. Is she? I actually don't know if that's true. Because Alice, well, does Alice in Wonderland count as a princess? But she's also super young. Okay. But anyway, yes, she's very young. She's a child. But she gets whisked away by her true love at the end. Yep, she sure does. (laughs) It's kind of problematic. (laughs) I don't think it really occurred to me how old she was in this. Um, I think I always equate her to being somewhere around Cinderella's age, which based on the high pitched voice they're giving her and some of like the body language and voice inflections, she is younger. But I've never pictured her as younger, if that makes sense. You know, her body shape is younger, too. Like, she really doesn't have any adult features. Um, Yeah, that's true. Yeah. She's definitely a kid. I think, though, that because she always ends up with the prince at the end, I've always assumed that she's older. Yeah. And the prince is fully, like, adult male. Yes. Which is why that's a weird thing. (laughs) And he's a prince... He doesn't have, like, a retinue or anything. He's just kind of trooping around the land with his horse. 
Yeah. Do we get any story on yeah. him? Like, there's all these characters that could have cool stories. We yeah. get none of it. I I wondered about that too. Like, Snow White's already a princess, right? So, what is he a prince of? Wh- like, where does he live? What castle are they approaching at the end of the story? Is he one of uh, Hans's brothers? <laughs> From Frozen, he's one of the twelve like older <laughs> brothers. <laughs> Because they're all just off traveling, like, well, we're not going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> the Prince Harry's of their time. Um, I, I feel the animation on her face. She looks very different to most of the princesses. And I think mm-hmm. it's because of the, the rotoscoping technique that they used to, that they basically filmed people almost in costume and then animated over the top of them, which means at times you get these wonderful, like, really lifelike animations. But it means you don't get the detail of the faces and some of the nuance. Um I think that's, it feels very much like something they did change for further films. Because mm-hmm. she sort of, it, certainly in my head and watching it, looks different than most of the, the, the other princesses that they do throughout the years. Yeah, she definitely appeared more human and lifelike than what you get later. I mean, because later you start evolving into Ariel and Rapunzel with the big, big eyes. Mm. Right. Um, the The pouty mouth, the tiny waist which clearly are not lifelike proportions at all. But with Snow White, it did feel much more natural. Although there was a significant difference between her animation and the prince's. Like the prince's face looked more like a person to mm-hmm. me than hmm. than she did. And I don't know if that's just the difference in, in the ages of the, the characters. Because like you said, Nichelle, he was a fully grown man. And that could account for it. But I did notice that they were done slightly differently. Yeah, that's interesting that that's how you remember it. Because I, like, in my memory, when I think of the prince in Snow White, there's, like, one scene in particular where his face is so, like, washed out, kind of, that it's like he doesn't have any features at all. And it looks like he's, like, over Snapchat filtered himself. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And so, like, I don't think of him as, like, looking very much like a person. I think of him as looking like a weird kind of whitish blob. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think there's times I, I can relate that it, it, exactly like Mandy was saying to her. I think during things like the dancing sequence, you just don't really see her face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in this that you could, you can absolutely see why, why this was the kind of first that they use as the template. There is so much in this film that remains a part of Disney forever. And mm-hmm. the fact that evil is this kind of lime green or purple, um, the, the way the villain uh, causes their own downfall at the end, the use of true love's kiss to mm-hmm. cure death. Um, th- there's a lot in this that just becomes a staple of, of all the films they make. And it's good. It works. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was completely shocked to see how familiar this was to movies that are now, you know, 80 years Mm -hmm. later, we're still seeing the things that this movie set up, be it the all of the Disney princess tropes of the high pitched voice and the giggles and like her body language, the way she moved and like threw her hands up when she was surprised having all of the animal friends, you know, um, having love at first sight or first song, however you want to look at it, all of these things still abide today. And that's, I don't know if that's a testimony to quality or just to, this is what everybody has come to expect. And so we're going to continue doing it. You know, um, her, the dancing, like the way she dances is a thing that we see in other movies. And that's actually because they, uh, like Disney animators went back to this film and used some of the same animation. Like they, d- instead of recreating dance scenes, just sort of like copied mm-hmm. the body movements okay. and just pasted new faces and new characters around. So like we see those, these same movements are so familiar because they're literally used in every film, um, yeah. which I think is kind of cool. And I think it's really a testament to like Disney, uh, like building this, you know, universe or world or empire mm. of uh, like, this is the quality we come to expect from Disney um, because this yeah. is what they've always given us. Yeah, absolutely. It, it speaks to the idea that they put so much effort into this. That it wasn't that the next time they had to improve on it or step up. It's like, okay, let's do the same again, but let's save money on it this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we use things and yeah, it's excellent. Talking on the animation, I, I do love... Uh, 
this is beautiful at times and so well done. They invented a new camera to be able to do some of the shots in this. They invented a, a multiplane camera that allows them to take shots of multiple pieces of animation at the same time and move them separately. Um, and there's an interesting piece of Disney talking about it and saying, when you have animation, they zoom in on one piece of it. And the whole thing would zoom in. The, the moon would get bigger. The trees in the foreground would get bigger. Everything at the same rate. So they basically created this like giant tower of a thing that they could slot different bits of animation in and move them. So they could do a shot that's a bit more naturalistic. And they continued using that through to oh, at least Aladdin and the Lion King, I think. <laughs> the same oh, sort wow. of thing. Until they started really getting into the, the computer effects that they bring in with uh, like the ballroom scene and so on in uh beauty and the beast mm -hmm. like that's the time at which it starts changing but for the most part it was okay this works let's keep using it hey if it ain't broke don't fix it mm. and then i think we should touch on the songs as well because <laughs> there are a lot of there, there are a lot of good songs in here but they're all really quite short at times and then suddenly you get this full length song that is the one you like haven't heard the one that I haven't heard. Not there the were like one. four that I haven't heard. <laughs> that blows okay, the, my mind. <laughs> the ones. But it is things like Whistle While You Work um, and Hi Ho that mm -hmm. are, are oft used. But yet the whole rubber dub dub, wash your face thing. Um, I, I'm not sure I'd ever heard that before. And it goes on forever. <laughs> it it really, really does. Song. Well, there's seven of them that have to wash their faces, guys. <laughs> <laughs> takes a while <laughs> yeah i also hadn't heard the the song where she was cleaning the house which was surprising to me because that whole scene was completely repurposed for enchanted which i had no idea mm. yep. i mean like almost shot for shot they were the same except because enchanted was in new york there were cockroaches too <laughs> but awesome and dirty dirty pigeons and rats and <laughs> But the song Wonderful. itself, I had never heard. Okay. It was weird. I had heard the the Whistle While You Work in the Hi-Ho song, and there was one more that I'm completely spacing on right now. Uh, wait Someday My Prince Will Come. Yeah. Someday My Prince Will Come, yes. Yeah. But I only know that one if you read my notes, because there is an amazing album called The Best of Country, Sing the Best of Disney, <laughs> and Tanya Tucker covered that song, and that is why I know it. <laughs> I, um, the, the, like, cleaning the house song, I sometimes play that song while I'm cleaning my house. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. You know, I play the one from Enchanted while I'm cleaning my I house. I also like that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more realistic. <laughs> Although I still don't, I can't figure out how to get any animals to come help me clean my house. Right? Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, a thing I really appreciated about that song, too, is how good Snow White is at delegating. <laughs> She's just like, all right, animals, we're going to clean this house. You do the dishes and I'll sweep. And I would also delegate dishes if I could. So yes. I appreciate her <laughs> her priorities there. And she stops them from sweeping under the rug. Yeah. Like she She's makes like, no, we're right. going to do this for real. Yeah. I did think it was interesting, though, that all it took for her to be accepted immediately by the dwarves was to promise to cook and clean for them. I, they didn't really care about the cleaning. They were kind of mad about the cleaning, weren't they? That's true, because the sugar's <laughs> gone the cooking, from the cup. the cooking they were into. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is an interesting thing, like, and this is sort of about Snow White as a character, um, and, pe like, we think of Snow White as being beautiful, and that's sort of her only quality that gets discussed, but, like, she's a great cook, and how many princesses are learning how to cook? Like, probably none. And that's kind of awesome. And she's also, like, super kind and giving and caring. Like, she just wanted to take care of the dwarves. She didn't really ask for much from them except, can I stay here? But she was like, I'll do anything for you. Like, I cleaned your house and I'm going to make you dinner and make sure you wash up. And, you know, she just, like, naturally wanted to take care of people. But those are not yeah. qualities we talk about with her. But she seems like she's pretty awesome. Yeah, honestly, she was a little bit badass by not letting them eat until they cleaned up. I know. Like, she's never met these seven men before, and she's like, no, you cannot eat until you show me your hands, and then you go clean them. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. It reminded me a lot of, have you guys seen um, the movie Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? No. It's one of my favorite musicals in the world, but there's a, a very, very similar scene to that where... Um, the main character, Millie, has been brought 
deceptively into this household um, to marry a man who has seven brothers that he didn't tell her about. And so when she cooks for them, they all come running in dirty, like climbing all over the table, throwing things. And she just gets furious and like throws the, like tips the table over on them and tells them if they're going to act like pigs, they can eat like pigs. (laughs) (laughs) And then the next morning she makes breakfast for them and doesn't let them come out until they shower and put clean clothes on and, it just it was amazing and i was like snow white is just like that and i had no idea yeah boss nice yeah things that you just don't get whenever you you just think of the st- i mean the story of snow white is the princess runs away and lives with the miners she eats a, fr- a poisoned apple gets put in a glass coffin and then kissed and she wakes up like that's it you don't really get any more details than that when you think about the story and so it's interesting to see some of the the more details of personality whenever you do watch the whole thing. Hmm. Even though we wish there was more, there was still a lot there that you don't normally get, especially if you're getting your fairy tales from like little golden storybooks. Mm-hmm. And and the thing that always makes me think of, and particularly I found this watching it, is just the number of things, like like we've been saying, that are... Um, an homage to this that are a meme based on this that are some sort of joke you know the the songs again the um it's off to what we go i can remember actually at school not being allowed to do the with a bucket and spade and hand grenade because the iraq war just started (laughs) they were like oh you can't do that when we do our you know 10 year olds christmas play um and whistle while you work, which I might try to find a clip. There's a famous clip from a, a an old comedy show over here where they, they sing a spoof of that about Hitler. Um, oh. Whistle while you work. Hitler is at work. He's half army, so's his army. Whistle while you work. Your name will also go on the list. <laughs> what is it? Don't tell him, Pike. Pike. <laughs> But even like the bit where she's everyone's dancing around her and she's sat there sort of pulling her skirt up a bit on the and and jiggling her shoulders became a gift meme for ages of like, see, I don't care about your point. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this film just gives so much into Enchanted, and I think it's Shrek Two that does the Snow White spoof, but then goes into the Led Zeppelin song that was used in Thor Ragnarok with her using the animals to attack everyone. Just taking okay. taking this film and turning it into something so much more fun. <laughs> Again, a bit like, you know, the, the the idea of this is better. Because when you watch it, it is a little light at times mm-hmm. and spends a lot of time on the filler. But there is so much that you can take from this and turn it into good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing. Hmm. Coming from the background that I did of not obviously not having seen this, getting my experience of this particular fairy tale from a storybook, I didn't actually know what happened to the queen. Like, Mm. my experience went from Snow White got the apple and Snow White, you know, passed out or whatever, and you get that iconic scene of the hand dropping the apple. Mm -hmm. And then it's a blank slate for me. I have no idea what happened to the queen after that. The next thing that happens is... The dwarves find her, she gets put in the glass coffin, and then the prince comes and he kisses her, wakes her up, and the story's over. It never even occurred to me to wonder what happened to the queen. And so I was actually completely shocked that the queen kind of brought about her own death and that she died. I don't know why it never occurred to me that she probably actually did have to be defeated because otherwise she would always be trying to get Snow White. But I just, I didn't know. Like, I feel like that's a thing I should have known, but I had no idea. So the queen dies in in this film, um, like while she's trying to, you know, kill the dwarves who are following her because they know mm-hmm. that it's her that poisoned Snow White. Um, but in the original, the original like Brothers Grimm story is much darker, as is true for most um, most Disney films that are that come from Brothers Grimm stories. Um, and like in the original story, I think the queen actually tried three different times to kill Snow White. Um, she like did three different things to try to mm-hmm. get to her, and the apple was the third one that was finally successful. Um, but one of the things she tried was to get Snow White to put on these iron shoes that she had heated in a fire that were going to like burn her feet. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, and so in uh in one 
one adaptation that I've seen, uh, the way that the queen dies is that Snow White and the prince, after Snow White is rescued, make the queen dance in those iron shoes at their wedding. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. Just like super dark. <laughs> um and uh and yeah, so I kind of I think that this movie, uh this story where the queen just sort of like gets struck by lightning and killed, um, is is less dark than it could be. Okay. Yeah, I honestly I don't know why it never occurred to me that the queen had to be defeated. It makes no sense to me, especially since in every other Disney movie that I've seen that happens like and i'm trying to think i don't know does the queen always die or does the evil witch or whatever always die or do they just get the like, captured hmm i have to think about that no they don't always die like the bad that you know the bad guy doesn't always die although they're not always evil queens either right but like right. snow white you know her stepmother and stepsisters are still alive at the end and they just don't get to be princesses mm which is the worst punishment for them. Yeah, I well I like the way Ever After did that ending, you know, made them all mm -hmm. work in in the the kitchen. Yes, <laughs> I like that too. Yeah, it, it, again it's a very Disney thing that it has to be they can't just kill the queen or the villain. It has to be either their own you know, it comes back on them and they die through whatever they they're doing themselves or there is no other way to stop them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're swinging the sword and you can't stop them in any other way, so you have to freeze them. Right. Mm. Which is which is fair for a kid's film. You cannot have the, you know, shade of grey of, oh, but they killed someone at the end. Ooh. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I thought that in this in this movie there was some cool uh like foreshadowing of the queen's death and like a hint about the fact that snow white wasn't actually dead mm -hmm. um in that the so the queen had um several birds actually that sort of followed her around she had a crow that was hanging out in her like mm -hmm. evil witch's lair um but she also had a couple of um vultures that were around her and at the beginning it seemed like they were around her because they knew that she was going to try to kill somebody and you know vultures want to eat things that are dead um but then when she actually gave snow white the apple and snow white seemed like she died the vultures were not there but when the queen was having her frantic moment on the top of this cliff um the vultures showed up before she fell like they knew that she wasn't going to make it um, and then she fell and they didn't, we didn't see her actually die. We just saw her fall. Right. Mm. But then the vultures gave this smile like, yes, we have food, which told you that the queen was definitely dead. And I thought, yeah, well, they also cool. started circling. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I did notice that. That's really cool. Yeah. They do like their symbolism with the birds mm -hmm. uh, and the animals in general having interesting things in there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I quite like that the crow is kind of comic relief, but the vultures are actually quite dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. So, Nichelle, I, I think you've already talked about a lot of the things that you really love about this movie, but what particular sticks out for you as being your favorite? Um, I just, I think I love the woodland creatures, um, and I love um snow white actually like i think she she earned and deserves her place as you know one of the iconic disney princesses mm -hmm. um because because of her qualities that aren't talked about but that she's this kind person she's got this great rapport and she's just so sweet taking care of you know woodland creatures like she saves a little baby bird at the beginning and um she just approaches everything with this innocence and kindness that i think is so valuable um, and so I think that that's probably just what I love about about this movie in general. I love that. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> what about you, Matthew? Um, I've touched on the animation a bit, but I will say the the sequence with the queen turning into the the hag uh, and making herself look all old is one of the greatest pieces of two D animation. And the fact it's from, you know, the the first full length in this way is just astounding. They basically use that camera I talked about. They spin the room mm -hmm. around her as, as she's spinning as well. So they're basically, even back in, what was this, 1937? Yep. Yeah. Using 2D animation to fake a 3D animation. 
and, and it genuinely looks like okay because there's different things moving in a in a, a, a stereoscopic fashion it's just wonderful it's so good and every time i see it i'm like okay that that is better than i remember it being it's awesome <laughs> uh, and then building up to that the queen's cape she rocks that cape just swooshes out behind her as she struts around this um around the castle great <laughs> Okay, but why does she have to wear that like hood thing? I never understood this. Even growing up, it always stood out to me that it was weird that you couldn't see her hair because she had it all covered up with like this wetsuit cap under her crown. Like, what is up with that? Uh, that's a great question, but we have to assume that she does have really nice hair under there because she's like second most beautiful person <laughs> in the land, right? Yes, so, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. I think that's one of the reasons why Snow White was never one of my favorites, I think, growing up, because the queen confounded me. <laughs> I'm a shallow person, especially as a child. I was. I admit it. <laughs> I don't think that makes you shallow. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to see if there's anything about why the hood. And there's nothing about why the hood, except it's, it was not an unusual thing. For someone particularly from that area of Europe? Oh, well, I guess that's true. Because technically this was set in, with the Middle Ages. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I guess they were trying to go for sem- like semi-realistic in-, in costuming, maybe? It's just yeah. not but what I would have expected. There's a statue that she- might have inspired her, is the theory, okay. according to this. Mm. Okay. Interesting. All right, I will I'd, allow it. I had never considered it, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it didn't bother me before either, but now I'm very curious about it. Yeah, I was, I'm was. i just a strange one. It's, I mean, it's fine. Even Jafar gets hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, give, give him where he lives in this one. Uh, yeah. They covered up a lot. Because of the sun. Not Aladdin. He just rocks a vest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mandy, was there anything that you particularly love about this? I think my favorite thing was actually one of the scarier scenes when Snow is running away from the Huntsman and she's just like running away through the forest at night. Mm. Um, The animation turned all of the trees into these like creepy creatures that have claws that are grabbing for her. Mm. But in reality, it's just branches in the dark. And I feel like that's just such a great representation of how fear can take over your mind. And to do it in a cartoon... I just thought was genius. It just spoke to me. I don't know why. I also really, really loved the turtle. (laughs) He was so adorable. And the poor guy just could not catch a break. He tried so hard to get up the stairs. He did. He tried every single time. Like he, he just like kept trucking up the stairs or across the floor. And every single time, like everybody just like ran back and like, made him have to start all over <laughs> like, but he was persistent yeah those were my favorites i love that scene where the trees come alive too i think um as a kid that scene was scary but but as an adult i really appreciate yeah sort of the the brilliance of uh making your surroundings scarier than they really are yeah Absolutely. Yeah, it feels like something we've seen. Again, we've seen it in animation a lot. Mm-hmm. But you can't do that in live action. Not easily. And even these days, we look at it with you know, CG and go, oh, it's not that good. But it's great in this. It's mm-hmm. really yes. spooky and really scary. And all the eyes in, in the in the distance, which look really menacing. And then they're very cute. Right. It, it's okay, <laughs> kids. You can come out from behind the sofa. Right. <laughs> All right, well, is there anything else that we need to discuss about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Um, So some of my sort of favorite Disney, like, trivia that um, is relevant to this movie. Um, The first thing is that the castles that we see, these iconic princess castles, are inspired by castles that are real um, Mm -hmm. and that you can go visit. So the Snow White Castle um, is from this castle in Spain, and it's, like, open year-round. You can go visit it. So if you want to feel like Snow White, um, that's where you go. Spain. Okay. Yeah. Um, Because it's Cinderella's castle at um magic kingdom 
It's Cinderella's Castle at okay. Disney World in Florida, mm. and it's Sleeping Beauty's Castle at Disneyland. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yes, and I I can't now. I can't remember. There's Disney World Paris and Disney World Tokyo, mm. and I want to say that they also have Sleeping Beauty's Castle, um, but I'm not positive about those ones. I cannot remember. I do not know. Yeah, <laughs> I've been to them. Couldn't tell you which one was which. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a terrible fan, Matthew. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> um. Yeah, and then one of the other things that I really love about um about Disney movies is so there's there's an owl in the forest and in this movie the owl is um during that scary scene when the trees are coming alive. Mm-hmm. Um but Walt Disney there's like this legend about owls and Walt Disney that he actually included an owl in almost every animated feature that he oversaw. Um and it's it's told that it's because as a child he shot and killed an owl and then he felt really guilty about it. So now there are owls in like all of his films. And this is a tradition that carried on after he died because he died in like 1960 something. Mm. Um, so Sex. of course there are lots of, yeah, good job. <laughs> um, so there are lots of, uh, lots of movies after his, after his death, but they still carry on the tradition of trying to have owls in them. Um, huh, and so I just love like, there were looking a for lot the owls. of owls. Yeah. Yeah, there were, yeah, there were a lot of owls in Snow White. I noticed them like they were carved in every chair, up the stairs, right, like just everywhere in the dwarves' house. Yeah, and so it's this legend that Walt Disney was trying to honor the life of this owl that he killed. Oh, that's nice, though. Yeah, yeah, and so often I think in this in this film the owl didn't. There wasn't like a owl character really um but often the owl characters that we see in disney films are like wise and kind and Mm. hopeful and so he's sort of trying to paint them in a in a good light makes sense Mm. yeah oh i'm gonna look out for that now yeah yeah keep an eye out for the owls did you want to talk about the snow white ride sure (laughs) this one's kind of silly but there's uh so i i grew up in florida so i've been to magic kingdom at disney world many many times nice um which is maybe part of why i love disney so much um i firmly believe that disney world is the happiest place on earth um and so there's a snow white ride at at magic kingdom that is one of my favorites and it's like a little kid's ride and again this is sort of the like this idea that snow white is a movie for little kids um even though the movie is kind of scary and the ride is the same way where it's like it's in the area where all the little kids rides are and it mostly is a little kid's ride but there are parts of it that are kind of scary like the trees come to life and the queen is all cackling above you trying to throw a rock on your head and it's kind of scary and and exhilarating and um and exciting and i really love it um and the line for it is often really long and it's not one of the rides that you can get a fast pass for you just have to wait in the 60 minute line but i always wait because i think it's worth it Aw, you're making me really want to go to Disney. Go to Disney. <laughs> I've Everyone been once. Go to Disney. I um, been... I actually went to Disney World for. I made my friends go um, with me for my bachelorette party before I got married, awesome. and I didn't live in Florida at the time. This is when I lived in North Carolina, so we all had to travel to Florida together to go to Disney World. And I made That's them all amazing. dress up as Disney princesses, and I dressed up as Snow White for my bachelorette party. Hey. Yeah. Oh, I remember those pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So Best I do definitely love Snow White. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I have a question. Hmm. At the beginning of this movie, there was like an introductory note by Walt Disney that had his signature at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Do we know, is that his real signature? Did they base the Disney font off of his signature or did they just use the Disney font to put his signature on that card? No, I'm pretty sure that's his real signature. Yeah. That's amazing. This entire iconic font is based on somebody's hand or actual handwriting. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. And of course, we've not touched on it. It has that slight moment of live action book in the beginning. Right. It does. Yes. And at the end. Mm. Yeah. I don't remember the end. Yeah. It's just the book closing. Oh, okay. Which is also iconic because that's been used in many, many other fairy tale adaptations. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think Enchanted did it, and Ella Enchanted did it, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sure there are others, but those are the, the two that are sticking in my brain right now. I think there are some adaptations of Cinderella that do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. It started like a whole, I don't want to say it started a trend, because it's not really a trend, but it, it started a, a 
thing that has lasted it, forever. Like, it set the tone for mm-hmm. how we tell these kinds of stories. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm really glad I've seen it now. Good. Me too. <laughs> All right. Just well, is another it... 60 or so to work through. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took me oh. and my husband like a year and a half to watch 73 movies um, that are wow. Disney movies. So... Pace I'm gonna have to, yeah. I'm gonna have to go through that list and see um, which ones I haven't seen. There are a lot. I guarantee you, I've probably maybe seen a quarter of them. Yeah, maybe, yeah, you, maybe not even that many. <laughs> um, which is kind of terrifying to think about, but I'll, I'll have to look at it and see. Yeah, maybe, maybe I've seen more than I think I have, and I'll surprise myself. Hmm. Yeah, I'll but be I interested to hear how you, how you've done on that list. I, I think there's about twenty I haven't seen. Most of which are your bottom ten, so I'm like, yeah, okay. so don't don't worry yeah. yourself about those ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you would like to join the conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. You can send us an email at podcast at eloquentgushing dot com, or you can leave us a voice message at speakpipe dot com slash eloquent gushing. You can find each of us on Twitter. I'm at Mandy K, and I'm at Matthew Bose. Nishal, thank you so much for coming and joining us. Uh, it's fabulous to have someone who knows quite so much about it for the very first one. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks what, for inviting me. Where can people find you online? Um, so I am on Twitter, but I only tweet ridiculous band names that my husband and I come up with in conversation. But feel free to come <laughs> <laughs> uh, pick out a new band name. Um, so I'm at band name Omatic. That's amazing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good fun, and we will we will definitely link to your lists uh, for the Disney movies. Cool, yeah, great. Pop culture deprived is one hundred percent funded by listeners like you through our Patreon page. Anything you can give, even one dollar a month, gives access to exclusive content and helps to support the network and support and develop new shows. To find out more, visit patreon dot com slash eloquent gushing. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest news announcements, remember to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. The link is on eloquentgushing dot com. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Pop Culturally Deprived, where we'll talk about The Jungle Book. Until next time, I'm Mandy Kay. And what wouldst thou know, my queen? Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.